was sweet sounding, amen? You get to stand up here on the side and, man, that last part, listen to all you sing. Man, you, you almost act like you mean it, amen? That's exciting when you get to be in church. Man, it's good to see everybody here today. Thank you again for braving the conditions and, and the blessings of rain that we got, and you, you, you still praising the Lord together, amen? I wanted to thank you for coming, and again, for all those who are joining us on the live stream, man, we're, we're in for a, a great service. It's been good so far, amen? What I want to talk about today is healing. You know, sometimes... Even in the church, we can get to where um, we get so familiar with a verse that it, it almost loses its weight. Just like, for example, John 3, 16, I think it's so familiar that people use it and, and we almost don't, don't understand the magnitude of what that verse means. Well, today I want to share a text of scripture in my message today that I think is another one of those verses that we use so often in the church that we preach sermons on it so often or we teach lessons on it so often that we basically lose the effectiveness of what the scripture really means. And so folks, listen to me. I want you to understand there's a great need of healing in our world today. Amen. A great need of healing. Man, we have, we have struggles, and we have hurts, and we have, we have wounds that need to be healed. And today I want to talk about those, because we need healing, and we need healing in our own personal lives. We need healing in our families. We need healing in relationships. And I want to look today at a verse that I think is too often times is we look at it kind of flippantly, like, yeah, there it is, nice verse, let's move on. And that is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Again, a very pa a familiar passage of Scripture. But I want to look at the, the magnitude. I want to look at the weight of this Scripture today. I don't want to just use it as some haphazard, oh, cute, that's really cool, we hope it happens. But I want to really look into this verse today, if you will. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning. The Bible tells us here, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Father, we thank you for today, and thank you for the blessings that you've given us and for the great singing that we just experienced. And Father, I pray that you have received it as a sweet, savoring offering to you. And God, what a blessing it was to stand off on the side there at the last stands in the last chorus and hear a congregation of people, Lord, that sounded like they're so in love. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for that and the encouragement it was to me and then to get to even be a part of that. And I pray for everyone here. I pray for those watching on our live stream service that God, your spirit would just breathe across this congregation and everyone watching. That God, we could begin to sense healing. Healing in our own lives and our families and even in our church and in our nation. God, we thank you for your word. And I pray that everything I say here today is not my words, but yours. I pray, Father, that this is not my message, but your message, and that, God, people would receive it as you desire. And, Father, it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Man, again, it's good to see everybody here. It's good to be back. Last week I was gone uh, on, on uh, a weekend of, of uh, weddings and graduations and all traveling and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but I want to thank Will. Uh, Ferguson for coming and, and sharing the scriptures and sharing the word with you just over the, those two services. And uh, I actually got to tune in with the live stream, and so that was really cool to get to do that. Uh, although, whenever I saw how long Will preached, I said, Will, you're killing me. I told him so yesterday morning, he was, uh, yesterday he was serving at that uh, funeral lunch, I said, Will, 24 minutes? Could you not go longer than that and make people wish that I was here? He said, man, I thought I went too long. I said, dude, I was, you were killing me the whole time. I'm thinking, you can't be finished. Give them 10 more minutes to make them wish I was back. But Will did a great job, amen? And so uh, I, I'm honored that he is here, part of our church, and willing to do what he did. But today, my friends, I want to look at 
uh, some things about our problems. Our land needs healing. Our lives need healing. Our families need healing. And, and I'll be honest with you, even in as elements of First Baptist West, we, we need healing. Amen? And so today as we're looking at that, I want to look at this text of Scripture and realize that where everything is beginning, where are our problems stemming from? What is the real problem with families? What is the real problem with churches? What is the real problem with society? What is the real problem? And it's very simple. It's a sin problem. Now, I know that's not very, that's not, uh, very kosher to say. That's not a uh, really popular statement because we don't want to say that we have a sin problem in our nation because no one wants to say that there's any, even any sin going on. But my friends, listen to me. The root of all of our problems start with the element of sin. We look in, and we read this text of Scripture, and the one thing I want you to find out is the first point about this, of being a sin problem, is there, there, there's a reason for this statement. We look in, and we read in verse 14, chapter 7, again, that very familiar passage of Scripture, and we know that there's a reason that God even said this. The reason God even made this statement was that if we were to continue reading or, or start reading in chapter 7, Solomon at the very beginning is dedicating the temple. And what he does is Solomon, you remember, was known as a wise king, amen? Amen. So Solomon in his wisdom knew that there would be a great possibility that some things could go wrong with the nation of Israel. And so what he does is he says in, in chapter 7, starting there in verse 1, he says, okay, God, what if, what if your people begin to practice idolatry and they fall away, will you forgive them? And what if they begin to uh, inject things into their lives that shouldn't be there? What if they begin to have animosities toward each other that they shouldn't have? What if, what if, what if? And so Solomon was asking God, there's going to be probably a sin problem, and if you read the rest of the Old Testament, you see that there became a great sin problem in the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that the nation of Israel split into two kingdoms. They got Israel and then and Judah. And so th Solomon was saying, God, if we have this huge problem come by, and this thing called sin, what will you do? Will you be able to forgive us? So that's the reason for the statement. It wasn't that, that God just threw this out there. Solomon dedicated the temple and asked, what if? And so God says that if my people, and that's why he begins that text with if. Solomon says, what if? And he says, well, if. And it wasn't so much as if, but really when. Amen. God knew, as a matter of fact, he even told when they got Saul as king, he said, your people are going to do this. He even told Moses, here's what's going to happen to the people. So he didn't say, basically he says if, but he says, when they do this, when this thing of sin creeps into the nation, when this thing of sin creeps into the lives of families, he said, then I will do these things. So there was a reason for the statement, but the, the reason is that the root of sinful nature, the root of our problems and our sickness is a sinful nature. Now again, the world doesn't want to hear about a sinful nature. The world wants to hear about all sorts of things that we can work on and we can improve of ourselves and we can improve with each other. And if we could just get better, then it's going to be okay. But God is saying here that the root to our problem is a sinful nature. My friends, there's sickness in our world, and it's rooted in sin. Amen? Folks, don't we have problems? We as a nation, we got all sorts of problems going on. Man, they're, they're, they're terrible problems. But what's wrong is that we're not looking for the root of the problem. We're trying to find all these little uh, self-help things and, and, and try to make things differently. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the problem is the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the problem that we have in our nation today is sin, that, that we are sinful people and our hearts are evil. And because our hearts are evil, our hearts get greedy. Our hearts get selfish. Our hearts get thinking about us and what we want and what we like and how we want it done and those who we like and those whom we don't like and, and those that we want to, to, to have a part of our lives and those that we don't. And it all stems from sin because when that sin is removed, then all of these things have been cured and taken care of. 
So the Bible says here that this, this sin is, is deceitful from our hearts. But I see what people are doing today. It's kind of like that we treat sin or we treat our problems or we're trying to treat our problems like people try to treat their dandelions. How many of you have had dandelions in your, in your, in your yard? And you fight that battle and you fight that battle. All those at home, you fight that battle. And then you look at your dandelions and say, man, I got to get rid of those. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mow my grass. I'm going to mow that grass, and it's going to get rid of the dandelions. And man, you get out there, and you mow, vroom, vroom, back and forth. If you're on the ride mower, you're on the push mower, you, you mow. And you, and you get it down, and you get off your mower, and you look out across your lawn, and you go, wow, I did it. Look how beautiful that is. I have taken care of my problems. You even leave that day and you go off and celebrate your great victory over the dandelions and how beautiful your yard looks and how you've eased all, you've taken care of all the problems. You come home that night as you pull in and it's still light outside maybe and you look across your lawn and go, well, I did it. Look at this beautiful lawn. Everybody, I'm going to be the envy of the world right now because of my beautiful lawn. No dandelions. Well, you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and you got all this joy in your heart going, oh, I want to go see my beautiful lawn that I worked hard on yesterday, and dandelions are gone. You look out in your yard, and what's there? Dandelions. And now, what you might have noticed is there's more dandelions now than there were the day before. And then you keep going, and the more you mow it, the more dandelions keep popping up. But yet you, you, you mow it, and it looks good on the surface. But what's the problem? The problem is the dandelion, the, 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 the top little stem and with the, the ball of fuzz on the top, that's not really the problem. You can mow that down all you want, but until you get under the ground and you get down to that root, guess what's going to happen every time you mow? A dandelion's going to grow up and more are going to come with it. My friend, I think that's what society is trying to do today. That's what we've been trying to do since the beginning of time, is that we would rather deal with things on the surface and say, oh, if we could just get it to look better, if we get it to feel better, if we get it to sound better, and we, we just make it all pretty. That's the problem. We've got to make it pretty. Well, folks, it can be pretty for a little while, but then all of a sudden the sin that is underneath in our lives, the sin that is underneath in our society, the sin that is underneath in, 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 in our churches, it will begin to pop right back up. And we wonder, what are we going to do? How do we deal with this? And so we know that there's a sin problem. The reason is, that, is because of the deceitfulness of our hearts, and we can't deal with it on the surface, but so many people in our society today want to keep dealing with things on the surface. So it's not good, my friends. Haven't we all agreed that there's sickness in our nation today? Oh, there, it, it's sick. Things are going on that should not be going on. People are treating each other like they should not be treating each other. Families are falling apart like they should not be falling apart. Churches are splitting that should not be splitting. Because there's a sickness called sin that's under the surface that keeps creeping back up. But here I, I want something. According to this scripture, we've detected the problem, but the prognosis. I want to deal very quickly over the next few minutes with the prognosis. Do you know what the Bible says about this prognosis of the problem of the sickness in our nation, the sickness in our families, the sicknesses in our church? Do you know what the Bible says about it? It's not deadly. It can be good. The prognosis is actually good according to the Scripture. Yeah, you got this sickness. Yeah, you got these things going on. But the prognosis, the outlook is positive, but you got to do something. So what I want you to understand is the healing is possible. Amen? Amen? Healing for our nation is possible. Healing for our families is possible. Healing for our churches is possible. Healing for our own individual lives, it's possible. It's out there. There's good news. Jesus said, or, or God says here in this verse, I will heal their land. Can I tell you that there's nothing going on in our nation today that's, that's hopeless? Nothing is hopeless. The prognosis is good. Now, comes the problem. The prognosis is good, but the cure, the remedy, 
is tough. He can change the relationships that we have with him. Now listen to me. If he, God, can change the relationship between us and him, between me and him, do you know what that'll do with all my other relationships? If my relationship to God is healed, you know what'll happen to all my other relationships? They'll be healed. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added to you. Seek me first. Come to me. There is a an ideology that if I turn myself to God, he will transform my life. That's why he tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want healing in the family? Have your relationship with God healed. You want want healing in the church? Have the church's relationship to God healed. You want healing in our nation? Have the, the hearts of the people healed to their relationship with God. And then we're going to see that healing. Healing is possible, my friends. Our views, our thoughts, our attitudes, yes, even, listen to me, even our biases, even our prejudices will be changed when we change our attitude toward God. God says that it's impossible for you to say, I love you, God, but I hate my brother. He said, if you'd say that, you're a liar. Because there's a sinful problem there that you can't hate your brother. I don't care who he is. I don't care what color he is. I don't care what nation he's from. You can't hate your brother if you say, and you love me. He said, those two things don't go together. If you love me, you're going to love your brother. He says, so if you, if you do have this hate, then you better wake up. Because this isn't right here then. That's what he's talking about. I will heal your land. Because my view My thoughts and my attitudes and my biases will change when I have that transformation of my life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Those old things have passed away. Now things are new. That's why David said, God created me a clean heart. You do this, God. I can't do it myself. You do it. So the prognosis is good. But here's the problem. We must take the full remedy. And this is why I said earlier that our view of this scripture is times taken flippant. Because I can't look at this and go, oh, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves to pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will come and heal their land. Cool. Then my question is, if that's there, and if it is true, why then... Why then are we not being healed? Why are our families not being healed? Why are the churches not being healed? Why are the relationships between races, why are they not being healed? Why are the attitudes toward those in, 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 uh, uh, over me, having authority over me, why are those not being healed? Because if it's here, why not? And the answer is because this is more difficult than it sounds to do. Man, this is a good verse, but it's hard. Because we can't just pick one or two of these and say, well, I like doing those, so I'm going to do it, and then I I want healing. No, he says you got to do it all. You can't do it partially and be healed. The prognosis is good, but you better do what you're supposed to do. That'd be like going to the doctor and find out you got something wrong, but he says if you'll do this, man, it's... You're going to be good. And we go, well, you know what? I don't really want to do that, but I want to heal anyway. It doesn't work. So here's what I want to look at. It's not just one or two of these that we, that we like. And again, this is where things are, are not simple. It's not just as simple as, as it sounds. Because the steps are there. First of all, what are the steps? The full remedy is this. The first one is humble ourselves. Now, what humble ourselves is truly realize who we are. Folks, do you realize that we can't have God heal us unless I humble myself before him? And this humble is, no, oh God, I know you're bigger than me. No, 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 that's, that's not it. That, that you humble yourself before God and you say, God, I realize that I have a sinful nature. I realize that my heart is evil. God, I realize that I can't do anything apart from you. And God, I desperately, desperately, desperately need you in my life. I can't heal myself. 
I can't clean up my life. God, I can't do this where I love people like you want me to love them. I can't have this agape love without you. God, I humble myself before you today. God, we as a church, we humble ourselves before you today. God, as a family, we humble ourselves before you today. God, here I am. Folks, we can't come proud of ourselves and thinking we're all that. It doesn't work. But we got to humble ourselves. Second one, we got to pray. Then everybody says, oh, okay, I'll, I, I like that one. I'll pray because I like praying. I, like, I pray over every meal. Amen? I pray over every meal, preacher. I'm, I'm halfway there now. Actually, if math would be right, there'd be a quarter of the way there, right? Yo, take my word for it. There's four of them. That's one. Okay, never mind. I'm not teaching math today. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm a quarter way there because I like praying. Listen, this praying is not just, Lord, thank you for this food that we're about to eat today. Bless it to the nurse on our bodies. Amen. Now, that's good. Pray for your food. Thank God for your meals. Amen. But what we're talking about here, when he says, humble yourselves, come before me, falling on your face, realizing that you can't do anything apart from him. Then it says pray. Now, this, this prayer that he's talking about is that fervent prayer. The Bible tells us in James 5, 6, he says the fervent, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, that when we truly humble ourselves and we focus our prayers then we're going to see that much is going to come from that. So this prayer that is passionate, this prayer that is heartfelt, this prayer that is heated and persistent, that God, I realize that I need you. God, I realize that there's sin in this world. And God, I pray that you would work your spirit. And, and we're troubled in our spirit because of all the things that are going on. And that God, I'm going to pray every single day. God, I'm going to spend time in prayer focused on you, focused on what you can do for our nation, what you can do for me, what you can do for my family, what you can do for my church, what you can do for those lost people. God, I'm focused on you every day. Now, my friends, listen to me. That type of praying is difficult. But he says this is what is effective. This is what is effectual. It's when you can come before God, humble down, and seek and, and pray for these things. Have a passion for it. And do you realize a passion and desire are not the same things? A desire is just something you'd like to have. A passion is something you need. Oh, I, I've got to have it. God, I, I have to see that our nation is going to be okay. God, I have to see that my family is going to be okay. God, I have to see that our church is going to be okay. God, I have to see that I'm going to be able to do what you want me to do. Folks, that's passion. And that's the kind of, kind of prayer that we're talking about. You see, so it's not just as simple as humble yourself and pray. No, it means to fall at the feet of, of God, at, the, at, at Christ. And then fervently pray with all that your every ounce of your being. Pray for these things to happen. And then the third one is to seek his face. Seek his face. What does that mean? That means be in his presence. That means come into the very presence of God. And so often though I hear people say, well, preacher, God's everywhere, so I'm always in his presence. No, you're always where he is, but doesn't mean you're in his presence. In his presence means that he has opened himself and you can feel him. You know he's there. You have come face to face with God. And this idea of, 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 of basically turning ourselves over to him and being in his presence. And how do we do that? Very quickly, just over the next few minutes. How do we do that? First of all, we do it by prayer. We just talked about it. That we come into God's presence with prayer. We come into God's presence with Bible study. When we open up his word daily, and my friends, listen, very, very, does a seldom, does a, does a message get preached from this pulpit for me that I don't talk to you about a daily time with God? Opening up his word, man. And I hear people all the time, oh, preacher, I just don't have time to do it every day. Well, then you're not coming into, that's one of the ways of coming into his presence. See, I told you it's hard. Amen? It's hard. So if you don't come into his presence through his word, you're not coming fully into his presence. So I believe that we as Christians need to be uh, filling ourselves with the word of God every day through prayer and Bible study. How about worship? Man, we come into his presence when we worship. When we come together through corporate worship, man, we we're coming into God's presence. And I hear a lot of people say, well, I just didn't feel like going to worship today. I didn't think I was going to get anything out of it. 
Well, I'm just kind of busy today. I just don't know that I think I can do it. But yet then we want to know, well, why are we not being healed? Because we're, folks, listen to me. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some do. Do you realize this is important? This worship is important. Man, I'm, I'm excited that we get to have a live stream service that people can join in at worship when they're not able to be here, but man, they can still be, be part of our worship service. Amen? Because this is part of our healing. This is part of our being in His presence. It's prayer and Bible study and worship and fellowship with believers. Man, we come into God's presence when we gather together with fellowship. When we confess our sins, man, we, the Bible says that our sin has hidden his face from us, divided us from him. And so we must confess this sin before him every single day. God, forgive me for the things I've done against you. And not just say, oh, flippantly, oh, God, forgive me of my sin. But no, God, I know today that I've sinned against you. Father, forgive me. And when I do that, listen to me, listen to me, we get to be in God's presence. Oh, and when we're in God's presence, that's seeking his face. Man, we're, we're three-fourths of the way there. And then we get to the last one. We get to the last one. He says, and this is even as difficult as everything, turn from your wicked way. If you will humble yourself, pray, seek my face, turn from your wicked way. Make a complete turn from this point. Not just say, well, God, I'm going to do differently today but actually turn and repent, and you're heading away from God. You're heading into toward things that you shouldn't be, maybe some aspects of your life that shouldn't be there, and you say, God, forgive me for that, and I repent, I turn away, and I go back to you. Not that I just do better, not that I just kind of clean up my life a little bit, but that I truly turn away from those things that are keeping me from God's presence. Folks, this is not easy. As a matter of fact, can I tell you, you can't do this on your own. You don't have what it takes to do these four things on your own. It must be God working in your life. God, I humble myself before you. I pray. I focus my prayer. I seek your face. And Lord, I turn from your wicked way. Can I tell you this as I get ready to wrap this thing up very quickly? Number four usually doesn't happen because number one and three don't. Four doesn't happen because one through three doesn't really happen. Because we can't do those things without humbling ourselves before God, praying and seeking his face. Then we'll be able to be transformed, to be changed, to be made different. Now here's the good news, though. They work in order. God didn't just randomly throw these out here and say, hey, just kind of pick whichever one you want. You want to do number four first? Do number four. You want to do three? Then three. Do you want to do one? Then do one, do one, do, do two. No. He says, look, here's what you must do. And they go in this order. Because, listen, you can't do four without number one. You can't do two without number one. You can't do three without number one. You've got to humble yourself before God. Then you've got to begin to pray. Then you begin to seek his face. Now, here's the cool, the, the great news. If you are doing one, two, and three, number four will take place because God will work it through you. God will bring the change. He will make the difference. So today what I want to encourage you to do is to look at this and say, God, I want, to, I, I want to humble myself before you today. God, I realize that our nation is in trouble. I realize, God, that our families are in trouble. I realize that some churches are in trouble. And God, I, I don't want First Baptist West to be in trouble if you're a member here. I, don't, I, I want you to pray. God, I don't want First Baptist West to be in trouble. God, I know that maybe my heart is in trouble. And God, I, I, I come to you today and I humble myself realizing that I can't do anything about this. God, I want to begin to pray. I want to begin to pray about our nation. Fervently pray. I want to pray for my church. Fervently pray. I, I, I want to pray for my family. Fervently pray for our family. And God, I want to come into your presence through prayer and Bible study and worship. God, so that you can do a great work in me. When you do one, two, and three, number four will come. So my question is, as I close, 
Why, if it's here, are we not experiencing the healing that, that has been promised? Seriously. Why? Because doing what the first Chronicles chapter, or Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says is hard to do. Easy to say, hard to do. So do you want healing today? Man, healing is possible for everyone. In your own personal life, man, healing is possible. The prognosis is good. It's good. You have sin. You Listen, you have the death penalty on you. But good news. For the wage of sin is death. But... Hey, do you know one thing that I, 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 know I told you I was finished, but I got, I, I got to add this one point. Do you realize, and I, I tell my family this, we've been even kind of talking about it quite a bit, that if we say something and then we use the word but, that everything we said before but is negated? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I'm sorry it hurt your feelings, but. Well, I'm sorry I did that, but. Well, once you say but, then the first part doesn't matter. You might as well not even have said it. Well, here's, okay, that's the bad news, but can I tell you the good news? Is that everything that's said before the word but is negated. For the wages of sin is death. That's good, amen? So that means if the wage of sin is death, but everything before but is negated, there is not having to be to you a, a, a wage of sin. It is death, but the good news is God has given us a gift through Jesus Christ. The prognosis, even with the death sentence, is good. The prognosis of our nation, even though we're struggling and we're in turmoil today and we're turned upside down, the prognosis is good. Even though our families are being torn apart from the seams, ripped apart by the things of Satan, the prognosis for our families is good. And for the churches that, that are, are splitting and, and, and separating and, and falling apart and closing, listen, that's death sentence, but the prognosis is good for you individually. You may be deep, steeped in sin, but I'm here to tell you the prognosis is good if, if, we will humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. He will then heal our land. Praise God. Praise God. So I want to mention that to you today, and I, I want you to see, where are you? Where are you with all this? Do you really want healing? Do you really want our land to be healed? Do you really want our nation to be brought back together? Do you really want our church to be strong? Do you really, really want your family to be solid as a rock, they can be. If. If. Everybody bow your heads as we step into this time. I'm going to ask the praise team to come forward. We're going to sing a quick song. And during this time, what I want to encourage you to do is, is we're going to stand at the end of, of this prayer couple things I want you to do. I want you to continue to pray. If God's burning your heart about something, I want you to continue to pray. If God is burning your heart to come to the altar and, and pray, fervently begin to pray, then the altars will be open. I want you to do that. Or if God is calling you to just sing praises to him, I want you to join in with this team. Or if you say, man, pastor, I just need some prayer. I need, I need some help. Then I want, to, I want to be down front with you. I want to pray for you. If you're watching this live stream, I want you to do the same thing. But if you're here and, or you're watching and, and you say, man, I need someone to talk to, would you call our church? We have people by the phones right now that will answer your call, pray with you. Would you do that this morning? The number is 536-4227. Would you call? We want to pray for you. So there's what I want you to do during this invitation time. Continue to pray or come forward to, to, to pray at the altar. 
to pray with me if you need to or to call the church if you need to or to sing praises to him. Father, hear our prayer today as we step into this invitation time. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand as we get ready to sing. Would you, would you come if you need to? Sit down where you need to and pray whatever God's calling you to do. Would you do it as we, as we pray right here? Just want to mention a couple things. Next Sunday is uh, our Celebrate Freedom Sunday. It's the Sunday prior to 4th of July, and so we're going to have a special service, two special services here. Now, if you're a member here, you know that normally for our Celebrate Freedom, man, we have a big deal. We have a big meal. We have a car show. We have all these extra things going on. Well, we're not going to be able to do that this year just with the fact of the coronavirus. So what we're doing is we're still going to celebrate our freedom, amen, because it's something to celebrate. And so we're going to do it at our 8, uh, 8.30 service and our 10.45 service. So we want you to come and be a part of that. Now, a couple things about that that I, I would like to encourage, that if you have served in the military or are now serving in the military, there is a special section during our service that we have our military roll call. And that way we honor every person that, that is connected to First Baptist West, uh, either prior to, to uh, your service or, or now if you're active. But we would need some information. So if you would call the church and get a hold of Linda, we've tried to get uh, contact with everybody that we possibly could. Uh, but if we miss you by some chance and, and you would like to be part of our roll call, it, it, it's not that we're going to flash up a picture and say lots of things. It's just that you're going to be part of our roll call. We'd really like you to do that. So contact our church uh, tomorrow morning or email us, whatever, uh, so we can have, make sure that you or your loved one is in our roll call. Also, tomorrow morning at 10.30, Gina, is it right? 10.30 in the morning, we're going to have some people here that are going to be decorating our church. And, man, they do a great job. If you'd like to help, man, come on up and, and uh, help us in any way that you can. And we'll have this thing really uh, decked out for 4th of July. So come and help us if you, if you would do that, okay? And also out back, uh, as you go out the south door or east doors here, um, we're, we're not going to be able to go to Falls Creek. Our students aren't getting to go this year because, of, again, the, the outbreak. But we are going on a, a, a retreat that we're going to take our students on a couple-day retreat to southeast uh, Oklahoma. And we're going to be, to help us keep the cost down, we're going to ask for some donations for food that we're, we, have to, we have to feed them. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Take teenagers somewhere and they want to be fed. But we're going to feed them. But, so if you would, as you go out the doors here, over to your left or on the north side, there's uh, two big uh, bulletin board things there that if you will look and see if there's something that you can help us with, we'd really appreciate you donating us some food so that we can uh, feed them, okay? So please, on your way out, do that. Now, what we're doing today is, uh, as we get to dismiss, uh, our ushers will be dismissing. And what we're going to do is the two north sides over here, you'll be dismissing first. And we're going to ask everybody to go out the east doors here. And as you do that, then we'll be dismissed. If you have a child in the preschool, we're going to ask you to go back the way you came in. Go out the south door, pick up your child, and then back around by the Sunday school office. So these two sections will go first, and when they're done, then we'll start dismissing over here on this side. Same thing, go out the, the, the east doors here, uh, and then if you have a child in preschool, then go out uh, the south doors there, and your child will be there and ready to go, okay? So the ushers will come here in just a moment and do that. And our offerings, we have offering boxes back there. If you'll put your offering in there, uh, we'd appreciate that as well. Let me pray with you. Guys, play us out. And then ushers over on this side, if you'll dismiss them first, okay? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for those who tuned in today during our uh, live stream service. Lord, might they uh, felt a great experience like we had here. And God, I just pray you'd watch over us now as we go home. Honor our fathers today, Lord, as we... As we spend time as a family, Lord, let that be a very special time. Protect those who are traveling. And God, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Our ushers will start dismissing.